righty, welcome back one and all to the Information Revolution, a podcast for people working with and interested in information. Uh, my name is Michael Upton. I'm an information management consultant in Wellington, New Zealand. Hello, and I'm Judy Verno. I'm an information architect, and I'm also in Wellington, New Zealand. And I'm Carl Miller, as I'm an information management consultant working out of Adelaide in South Australia. And who do we have this morning? <laughs> there we go. Hi, uh, everyone. I'm, I'm Doug Laney, a uh, consultant who has lived in Wellington, uh, and enjoyed times in Adelaide, a uh, great, great town, um, uh, from Chicago, currently back living in Chicago. I'm a consultant with the um, the consultancy West Monroe. Uh, interestingly, it's a it's a consulting firm born from the ashes of Arthur Anderson. If you remember oh, right. the Enron yeah, scandal yeah, yeah. Uh, twenty some years ago, um, some uh, uh, kind of blew up uh, Arthur Anderson, and some of the consultants from their business consulting services group got together at a at a pub here in Chicago and decided to form a new consultancy. And so here we are, twenty years later. Uh, about 2,500 consultants specializing in uh, digital and and business uh, uh, services and and digital services for uh, mostly um, upper mid kinds of organizations. Um, I'm what's called an innovation fellow with West Monroe. So after a long career at Gartner as an IT research, um, senior IT research uh, advisor and analyst um, and writing the, the book Infonomics decided to kind of put those ideas into practice um, West Monroe was kind of all in on the concept of infonomics, which we'll talk about. And so um, I decided to join up with them. So my role is to develop new and innovative offerings around uh, concepts having to do with data strategy, um, more specifically data monetization and valuation and managing data as an actual asset. Um, and then I, I speak and write. Um, I write for Forbes. I, I teach at University of Illinois and Carnegie Mellon. Um, I do some executive education courses and uh, speak at conferences around the um, around the around the world. So that's a little bit about me. You sound like a busy guy. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, my my wife would agree. Um, uh, too much so. Yeah. <laughs> ah, that's great. So, Michael, you're going to open for us, aren't you? Yeah, for sure. So uh, all I was going to kick off with, Doug, was to just ask you about sort of that concept of infonomics and perhaps you mm-hmm. can trace some of the evolution of that idea and where it's at now. And um, has that sure. changed over time for you? Yeah. So the, the backstory <clears throat> on infonomics uh, uh, was kind of precipitated by a, a, a very sad, um, tragic chapter in American and, and global history, and that was the 9-11 terror attacks. And so after those terrorist attacks, some companies in the in the Twin Towers that were destroyed reached out to us at Gartner and said, hey, you've done some work on valuing data. Can you help us quantify the value of the data that we lost? Remember, this was in the days before cloud um, storage and before offsite backups. So um, a lot of companies uh, lost their, their data. They no longer had records of their contracts, their transactions, their customer lists, even their employees. And so it was uh, quite an existential event for some of the companies. And um, not only just you know, a terrible tragedy, but you know, they, they, it, it, their, their businesses were at risk because the, they had lost all this data. So naturally, w- what do you do when you, you suffer some kind of loss? is you contact your insurance company. So they asked us to quantify the value of their data so they could submit claims to their insurers for the value of the data they lost. Um, The insurance companies responded by saying, um, we don't believe data is property, therefore it's not covered by your property and casualty policies. Um, And that got um, the hair kind of the hair on the back of my neck you know, standing up, I'm like, well, why isn't data property? Isn't it an asset? So I cracked open my accounting books from university to learn that an asset is something that is owned and controlled, exchangeable for cash, uh, and generates what accountants call probable future economic benefits. It's also what needs to be separable from other assets. And so it was pretty clear to me that data meets the criteria of an asset. Um, I just didn't quite understand why um, it isn't considered property. Now, there were a number of court cases that ensued, and, and some of the courts ruled that um, 
they, it, not necessarily related to 9-11, but other cases where data has been stolen or misused or copied or misappropriated. Um, some of the courts have ruled around the world that data should be considered property because it can be represented by bubbles on an optical disk or it can be printed you know, and manifested in some physical way. Um, other One other court in particular ruled um, that data should not be considered property because, catch this, because electrons have negligible mass. <laughs> so, um, fantastic. And so, not, not to be outdone. They, so, what the the insurance industry in the U.S. did was they updated the commercial. They realized they were a bit exposed because uh, the the policy documents were not really clear. So, they updated the uh, commercial general liability policy template to explicitly exclude data from balance sheets uh, from from exclude data from PNC policies, from prop property and casualty policies. Not to be outdone, the accounting profession uh, followed suit and said, hey, well, if the courts are confused as to whether data is property, uh, the insurance industry is not going to recognize it as property, then we're not going to recognize it no longer as an asset. And so now even if you wanted to, you could no longer include the value of your company's data on your balance sheet. Uh, they made an up update to uh, International Accounting Standard 38 um to prohibit the capitalization of data on, on balance sheets and they did that um, about nine, about 2002 i think it was ratified in 2004. so um that all you know while the rest of the world and, and companies are trying to become more data driven and leverage and manage and treat their data as an asset um, the keepers of the definition um, kind of a doubled down on their antiquated notions that it's neither a property nor nor an asset um, so that led me down this path of, well, gosh, kind of forget, let's forget what the accountants and the insurance companies say. We should really start treating data as an asset. And so what does that entail? That entails, um, one, measuring it, you know, um, because you can't manage what you don't measure. So let's measure data as if it were a balance sheet asset. And there's other things about data that we might want to measure, like its quality characteristics. Um, and, and then uh, that'll give us the ammunition that we need to manage it like an asset. Um, and maybe we should be applying asset management principles and practices to data, right? the way that we are doing with other our physical assets, our financial assets. And then the third part is, uh, what, do we, what do we do with assets? Well, we generate value from them. So what are the ways that organizations can monetize or generate value, new and innovative value streams from their data? So that, those are the three kind of cornerstones of Infonomics, monetizing, managing, and measuring data as an actual asset. Um, and so that's what I researched uh, while I was at Gartner, published the Infonomics book, um, which turns out was a um, CIO magazine must read book of the year and Wall Street Journal's uh, recommended reading list as, as well. So um, yeah, really, really pleased with um, you know, how it's helped organizations become more, more data driven. But it's interesting too, because I mean, we're in a place now where mm -hmm. I... I mean, information valuation for me seems like one of the problems. And, you know, I mean, just yesterday, you know, there was a discussion about it, you know, at one of the RIPPER groups that I'm part of. But I don't see organisations doing it. And, and I, I don't see them valuing their data and information. I don't see them. And, you know, I don't see all of the sort of incentive changes that I would expect if people are clear they're now working with an asset. I don't see a focus on asset quality um, mm -hmm. in most of the organizations that I'm dealing with. I mean, getting people to have a conversation about information quality is very, very difficult. You know, it's one of those mm -hmm. things that where I, I always feel like people are looking at me and, you know, thinking I'm off with the fairies because I want to talk about the quality of the information that they're using. I, I, I guess I'd be interested what your experience has been of, of, of how you start something like this. We've identified, you know, a dozen or so reasons why an organization would want to or should quantify the value of their data, whether it's um, justifying spend on data management or other kinds of IT re resources related to, to data management, whether it is lighting a fire under the business to do more with their data than just simply, you know, build pretty pie charts and bouncy bar charts and dashing dashboards, right? Um, and um, uh, there's other companies that want to value their data for uh, corporate transactions. They're considering being acquired or merging with another company. And so data is 
increasingly part of that corporate transaction. And it's important to understand what you're getting yourself into or perhaps the premium um, that you might want to pay for uh, acquiring a company based on the value of its data assets. So there's there are a lot of different reasons why companies would want to value their data. Um, a lot of times we're finding it's because they want to determine what is the potential for monetizing it to generate new revenue streams or new value streams from their data. And by monetize, we don't mean necessarily sell it, but to build data products that are usable internally or externally uh, to, to drive value. And maybe you're selling or licensing those data products or those insights or those reports or those analytics, or maybe you're baking data into an existing product or service, or maybe you're um, extracting data from a product or service to monetize it. Um, there are a lot of different, we've identified a dozen or so different ways, uh, patterns of data monetization. So most of my work is around um, helping companies value their data for the purposes of um, justifying investments in uh, data monetization or justifying investments in you know bringing in and hiring a chief data officer or setting up a data office or um, justifying spend on enterprise data management as i said i mean how, do, how does that conversation normally go and, mm. and the you know the the reason that it's it's really interesting to me is that you know i mean i, I think there's a there's always a, a a stream of value coming off your information you know you, you're always the speed you move it around with the quality of your business processes they all rest really heavily on it but then you come in and you say right now we're going to explicitly value it because we want to spend more money on managing it mm -hmm. i mean how, how does that I, I i guess is that how the conversation normally goes or or is it because I, I i'm just i'm stuck on what, what very I'm stuck often, on. yeah very often now organizations are coming to us because they've they've either heard me speak or they've read the book or they're otherwise realizing that they're sitting on a gold mine of data that they are not um, generating value from. It's just sitting there kind of you know fallow and 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 latent. Um, so they'll come to us and and they'll they'll look around and say, okay, who who knows how to do data monetization? And they'll come to West Monroe because they've seen something I've written or you know heard me speak. So that's how kind of those conversations get started. Um, eventually, you know we like to involve the the CFO you know, the accounting team to help us validate the data valuation models um, that we're implementing for them. And, and you know, no two valuation models are the same because there's no standard. So there may be things that they want to measure about their data. They may want to measure its, um, uh, its, its current utilization or its potential utilization against a host of use cases, or they want to understand various quality characteristics like its uh, accuracy or completeness, timeliness, integrity, and so forth. Um, does that so, does that include government departments? Have you? Yeah, so government that? departments are a little bit different because uh, they they monetize data a little bit differently. Government departments will typically use data to either generate, uh, often to generate uh, economic um, activity, right? So you know, I've met with the the government of New South Wales, and and they're like, well, listen, we want to measure the the contribution of the data that we're uh, collecting and making available to the community and, and to, to businesses and the impact that it's having on, um, on economic development. So that's, that's usually the conversation there. Now, now that I'm at Western Monroe now, and we actually don't do business with the government. <laughs> so we, we don't have a government contract schedule. So we, we focus on, on other industries right now. Um, but it, I mean, it, it obviously is a, a, a different proposition in the sense that, uh, as you mm -hmm. say, that monetization is not related to then, well, particularly not selling something, right? And so right. trying to establish value based on mm -hmm. what you could get if you took something to market doesn't really apply if right. you're not in the business of selling uh, your data. Right. So, so I think I neglected to give you what our, our concise you know, definition of data monetization is. It is the... Mm -hmm the process of generating new and innovative value streams from existing data assets. Um, and so there's a few things to kind of unpack there. One, it's new value streams. So looking at using data in, in new ways. Two, the value streams could take many different forms. It could be um, generating some goodwill. It could be generating cash. It could be exchanging data in return for goods and services or favorable commercial terms from trading partners. So it takes a lot of different forms. Um, 
it's also needs to be measurable. So there's already a lot of things that companies are doing with data that they don't measure the impact that the data is having. They don't connect the dots between the data and the outcomes. Um, and then um, by available data assets, what I mean there is that there's a lot of, of external data that can drive value for companies, not just their own data. So they need to look outside their own four walls as to what kind of data is available from social media, from web content harvesting, from public data sources, from um, uh, partners that they can trade with uh, and so forth. So um, being aware of, of those external data sources is really, really important. Um, when it comes to, to monetizing your data or coming up with ideas on how to monetize your data. And I, I come from a, a publishing background way way back and we were all about how can you exploit your data assets, mm -hmm. you know, to the to the greatest to the greatest benefit. Publishers have been great at that. It's the business yeah. model, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. You, data has these unique characteristics. You know, a lot of people compare data to oil, right? Data is the new oil. You've probably heard of oil. oil. Hard to go a week, you know, without hearing somebody you know, spout out about that. Um, but it, it, well, that, that certainly is legitimate in terms at a macro level. Like data is definitely a driver of the economy today, the way oil was or you know, still continues to be uh, to, to a large degree um, starting a century ago. But it misses the point that data has unique attributes that oil doesn't have. Um, as a publisher, Judy, you know, data is something that you can use over and over again, right? It doesn't get used up, so it's not yeah, depleted. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's you can it's use it multiple ways simultaneously as well. So it's in that way, it's considered to be uh, what economists would call non-rivalrous, and that um, non-rivalrous. I love non that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah it's, an, it's a resource or an asset that multiple people can use simultaneously. Right. Um, and then the third is that the third big one is that uh, data is a progenitive. And that is using data typically creates more data. Yep, yep, right? yep. That makes so, sense. So the companies that are thriving today are the ones that are taking full advantage of those three characteristics, that it is non-depleting, non-rivalrous, and progenitive. They're using it over and over again. They're using it simultaneously in multiple ways, and they're using data to generate, to collect or generate more more data that's, that's valuable. Um, there are other... Characteristics that are different too. Data has, you know, lower lower inventory carrying costs. And, uh, you know, if you spill it, it's more difficult to clean up than even oil is. So <laughs> there's some other differences. But um, yeah, I think the companies that really have business models that are based on those those three main differentiating characteristics, economic characteristics of data, are the ones that are really uh, winning today. And so, do you see that in government much? Because I, I will be, you know, I mean, this is this is the work that yeah. we do. Generally, who we work with. I mean, I'm in a bank at the moment, but you know, mm. generally in government. And I'm not sure I see this kind of approach very often. And I no. certainly don't seem to see an awareness of what's being captured and how it can be used. What I generally see is a lot of documents accumulating in lots of places mm. and nothing, no secondary usage. So, you know, they yeah. kind of, and management is all about making sure that, you know, they kind of get destroyed at the right time, which frustrates me. I think with the, you know, generative AI, you know, uh, large language models to, today, a lot of that documentation is starting to come more online and, and find new sources yeah. of utility and, um, and, and benefits. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, this is where the crude oil analogy is the right one, though, too, because I, I've always, you know, looked at data and kind of gone, you know, the whole data is oil conversation. I'm just kind of like more like crude oil. You know, you, you dig it out of the ground. It's hard to, find. to be refined. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got a massive refinement process mm -hmm. before you get anywhere near any kind of value. Um, I mean, yeah. how, how do you that's probably a good question. I mean, how do you see the whole generative AI piece? going inside organizations in the next couple of years? Have you got any thoughts on that? Because I've literally got asked about it by someone in government. Yeah, yesterday. I think it's it's, it's uh, giving new new shedding new light on and giving new benefits to unstructured content. Um, unstructured content has been really hard to to leverage, um, other than for its original purpose. Right, you get an email, you respond to the email, it goes into an archive. Right. Yeah, so um, there there are companies like um, uh, manufacturer Lockheed Martin. You know, that's using um, 
at least data science, if not advanced AI right now, to um, analyze project documentation to identify issues, project issues. Um, so they're analyzing emails and, and other sorts of project documentation on a continuous basis to um, identify issues related to scope or budget or personnel or technology related issues. And they claim they now have three times greater foresight into um, project issues um, or risks than, than they used to and are saving hundreds of millions of dollars a year you know, in, in cost overruns. So there's some you know, great examples like that. I, I've, um, I don't know if you have my second book there, Carl, but my, my latest book is... Data Juice. Yes, Data I do. Juice, have right. So Data Juice is uh, that's a compilation of 101 stories on how organizations are using data and analytics and AI in innovative and, and high value ways. So the book is meant to be uh, um, to inspire you know, or shame uh, business leaders and data leaders into <laughs> doing more with their data. Which have so a label I now have over a thousand, uh, a thousand use cases. And speaking of generative AI, I've actually built a chatbot um, that we use internally here at, at West Monroe that has incorporated all of my articles, all of my books, all of my podcasts and webinars, and um, and uh, and and these thousand uh, plus use cases. So we use it internally to help us in workshops and. Um, respond to uh, our create RFPs, uh, respond to create proposals and um, write emails to, to clients. And so we call this uh, this chatbot uh, digital Doug, for lack of a better, <laughs> lack of a better term. So um, nice. I'm thinking of monetizing it. I'm thinking of making it available publicly um, and having people subscribe for you know, $20 or whatever. That'd be cool. Okay. Yeah. If, I mean, if, if you're an organization, if you're in an organization and you and you're looking at generative AI, um, mm -hmm. I mean, what are the kinds of things that you really that, that you want to think about up front? Yeah. W one, I want to use it to to help with exposing content, right? Um, to to help people find what they're looking for, to relate it to what they're doing, to um, generate insights from that content, um, to be a you know, uh, more of a, a, a pilot, a co-pilot than the pilot itself. Um, gosh, we're using it for, for so many, so many different uh, things. Um, I used it to uh, analyze some data from a, from a survey that I ran last year. Um, I had about 600 respondents, about uh, 100 columns of data. So, um, and I gave the data to some interns to, to crunch, to find some insights and findings. And while they were doing that, I fired up, you know, chat GPT and loaded up the data and said, you know, uh, I just had a conversation with it to, to find insights. And it, it found more, you know, more interesting insights and trends and patterns in 30 minutes than my interns did in two weeks. So. Yeah. yeah I mean, so in terms the, of how, how much of a problem is quality? For, for generative for generative AI tools, I mean, we're seeing Copilot now, and you know, everybody who is a Microsoft customer seems to be interested in it. What, yeah, what like just as analytics, it's only as good as the you know what it's been trained on or what content it has access to. So, and if you want to start the quality conversation w within your organization because of ChatGPT, I mean, what are the sorts of things you think are worth focusing on? That's a re really good question. Um, I would say timeliness is a big one. So if we kind of go through the factors of quality, you know, we have accuracy, but it's hard to assess the accuracy of, of unstructured content. Um, we have the completeness. Okay, so um, is our content limited in some way? Is it incomplete from uh, uh, the perspective of, of the, the universe of all potential content that's related? Is our purview you know, somewhat limited? And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a bad thing. But um, And then is it is it timely? Um, is it consistent? You know, those are some things that you're going to you know, want to look at. And I, I actually think that we'll start to see some tools or techniques start to emerge to assess the quality of the underlying um, content that a, a language model has been, been trained on. So that's that's coming, which gets me to kind of think about the two sides of, of this um, from a data management standpoint, because um, I, I focus on data management a lot, which is, one, how do we use um, generative AI to facilitate data management. So we can start to um, do things like um, categorize data, right? Or assess its quality. Um, and, and then um, 
you know, and, and then how do we manage our data assets to make them more valuable for, you know, for language models. So kind of two sides of the same coin. Yeah. And, and this, I mean, this for me is the, you know, I mean, we, we all work in information management and generally we're looking at unstructured content. And, you know, mm -hmm. this is one of the things that I'm personally grappling with at the moment. You know, there's a conversation I've got going with someone about the, the sort of forward looking, you know, five, 10, 15 year strategy for a, a very, very large government department, you know, sort of more mm -hmm. than 50,000 employees and generative AI has come up and I am really struggling with how we get to the point where we can trust anything. And, you know, it's the basic, it, it, mm -hmm. it's the basic copy problem and it's the basic version problem. You know, I mean, how mm -hmm. do we, how do we train the content? How do we train the machine on content that's authoritative? So, yeah. that, you know, the answers we're getting back are correct. How do we make sure we exclude the drafts and the, you know, 900 versions that are incorrect? Yeah. I, I think it's important to um, assess the output and the outcomes. Are the outcomes generating the benefits that you anticipated or that you want. Um, and if it is, well, then the assumption is that the model and the underlying content is, is good okay. or good enough. Right. So if, if you're not justify means, Doug. Yeah, the ends justify the means, right. So maybe a little simplistic, but, no, 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 but I, I, I think it's good. I think we you can, you know, we can try to uh, you know, empirically assess the quality of a learning model or the underlying content. Um, I don't know if you're really going to we're really going to get anywhere doing that, but gauging the quality of the output or the, or the utility of the output, I think, is where where we'll be able to better assess um, the, the quality of the, the the models and the and the underlying content themselves. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's I mean, fine. I think that it really lines up with something that I see as being a bit of a challenge in the conversation mm -hmm. around around mm -hmm. GPT, basically. Well, you know, and being gen general about generative AI mm -hmm. there, um, where I see um, there's all this kind of hang-ups on this idea of, you know, that the that, 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 that kind of meaning in there, whereas, I mean, the way I try and think about it and, you know, as a, somewhat of an outsider to it is that, I mean, essentially these models are presenting a bunch of squiggles that the model itself doesn't understand or the algorithm itself doesn't understand. It's probabilistically mm -hmm. presenting the right stuff based on, um the everything that it's consumed and what it's been trained on and so asking these questions about oh whether it's not it's getting the right answer almost feels uh, i mean uh, like of course we have to understand that but we need to mm -hmm. understand we don't really need to probe the accuracy of the model we need to we need to be really clear on how we're using it in the overall process and then what what occurs afterwards so that idea of focusing on the outcomes you get from it um a couple of things there what is like you can use the yeah, I mean, you can use generative AI to 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 question itself, right? Sure. So you can have, ask it to question the output um, uh, or rethink a problem, uh, and then also, uh, I mean, maybe they're sort of becoming a little aware. You, I don't know if you saw the story about uh, the researchers who were testing Claude by inserting uh, kind of a needle in the haystack. Did you see this the story? I and, didn't know. Um, not only could it identify the needle in the haystack, but Claude realized it was being tested. It said, I think you're testing, you know, I think you're testing me, right? So uh, there was some semblance of sentience there, I, I think, I don't, you know, we'll call it what you will, but when a model becomes aware that it's being tested, uh, that that's an interesting day. That's creepy. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, a little bit, yeah. Thinking about our audience, as Carl said, you know, we, we work in a kind of land of information management where, where a lot of the focus is on unstructured data. And I mean, we, we've, we've touched on that a little bit and, you know, that there might be different things to think about there. I'm just interested to just um, just to hear a little bit more from you, Doug, around um, in, in your work so far around infonomics so far. It makes it sound mm -hmm. like a brand new thing. Um, have you talked about unstructured information or unstructured data and sort of how does that play out in, in your thinking around the sort of economic um, valuation or, of, of data? Yeah, I mean, even in the early days of, of data science, I realized that um, th there's a lot of untapped value in unstructured content, whether it's emails or documents or, or multimedia. Um, and we just didn't have the tools, the horsepower, to really do much with it other than 
you know, read it and search it. Um, and now we've got the ability to to really deeply assess and analyze that that content um, in ways that were, you know, a few years ago in, in almost inconceivable. So, to some extent, the fact that it's unstructured just becomes kind of one of those qualities, or you know, mm -hmm. that's yeah. kind of how data in your mind is that? Yeah, it's kind of how like you know, we were, years ago we were talking about uh, big data, right? You know, today kind of all data is big data other than you know reference data or metadata right so um we don't really talk about big data anymore because it, it just is right so i think we're seeing the same sort of thing with unstructured content we still refer to it as unstructured versus structured probably in the next five years it's just going to be data we laugh simply because in our world you know we uh we typically talk about data as being a subset of information rather than the other way around <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, mean, I don't. I don't love that whole that whole data knowledge wisdom, uh, data information knowledge wisdom thing. I, I don't know. You tell me. I, but as a consultant, I never. I've never seen any organization like implement that pyramid in any you know meaningful meaningful way. It's always got about outcomes. Take. What outcomes do you get out of implementing that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah what yeah. does that drive in your organization? Right. Right. Yeah, you know, I my, to chief executives and tell them that the whole point of my work is so that they can be wise, and you know they just naturally buy into that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I've written a couple of quite ranty blog posts over the years about the the DIKW pyramid. Uh, mm. Someone introduced me to the DIKW model a number of years ago. You know, data, information, knowledge, actions, and results. And honestly, I, I've stopped talking about data, information, knowledge, and wisdom, and I use that. And honestly, it just it just cuts through so much of the crap, you know? What is the result yeah. we want? How are we getting there? You know, this gets to, to kind of one of the, the underlying themes of, of infonomics, which is we data professionals have been reinventing the wheel for uh, new terminologies and uh, semantic ontologies, blah, 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 everything to kind of confuse the, the business people um, and really distance ourselves <laughs> from, from them. Um, and so infonomics is really about applying traditional asset management principles and practices to, to data. Um, and, and if you're a financial services firm, why not apply financial asset management concepts? the way that you're, you're managing your data. If you're a physical company like a, a manufacturing company or a retailer, why not apply, uh, you know, PAS 55, which is a standard for how to manage physical assets. Why don't you apply that to the way that you're managing your data? If you are a, a, a services firm, maybe why not ap apply human capital management concepts to the way that you're managing your data? And that way, not only are you using concepts that are familiar to the organization, but now you're speaking the language that the rest yeah. of the business is using. Um, and I think it would really endear, uh, it would really endear us as data professionals to the business if we started using their language in describing the way that we manage and, and use and handle data. Um, I remember talking to a uh, um, guy who was, uh, I don't know what his role was, I think he might have been a, a data executive with, with Stats New Zealand. And he told me years ago, he said, yeah, we, we have this uh, policy where we train everyone on data safe handling procedures, just as if we were a manufacturer uh, on safe material handling. And we apply that same principle to the way that we're handling data. Um, and nobody gets the keys to an analytic tool or the, the ability to access data until they've been trained and certified on these safe handling procedures. I think it's brilliant. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, I guess I've got a, I mean, that raises a question for me too. I mean, how, mm -hmm. How can how can we as information and data and you know whatever other label we're giving it, um, mm. management professionals become sophisticated users of that stuff? Because I've got a I've got you know one of my one of the real downsides and one of the real challenges I see with people talking about information assets is that I I have never met somebody who likes to talk about information assets who can really have a conversation about an information liability, and. I wonder if that damages yeah. us when we go to talk to finance people who think in terms of, you know, if there's an asset, well, how do you know this is an asset? You know, what, how right. are you measuring the future, you know, cash flows yeah. you expect to get from this thing, you know? Right. If we're not measuring all that, it's just hard to claim it's an asset. But but we know data is an asset. There should be an asset because it's owned and or controlled, exchangeable for cash and generates 
you know, probable future economic benefits. So if you go take that argument to your CFO, they're not going to disagree with you. They're just going to say, well, you know, we don't report we don't report on it. So I don't yeah. care. Right. So yeah. And, and I think that's part of the crux of the problem until the accounting profession actually recognizes data as an asset, um, that it's going to be really difficult for for data professionals to get the kinds of budgets and resources that they need to manage it like an asset. How do you put the 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 value around that? How do you recognize question, yeah. what the value is? So we can apply any of the, the the three main approaches to valuing an asset. So there's three approaches that accountants and valuation experts use. Uh, the first is the cost approach. So what did that asset cost us to generate or, or purchase or collect, right? Um, the second is the market value. What is this data assets? What would people pay for this data asset um, to have access to it, right? It gets a little interesting because typically we don't sell data, we license data, so we're not transferring ownership of it. So um, the models for that I've, I've published in Infonomics um, require a bit of optimization. So you have to kind of optimize that price versus um, 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 supply you know, curve. Um, and then the third way is the income approach. What is this asset's contribution yes. to a revenue stream um, or expense savings? Um, we like to, one, look at the market value because we're often dealing with companies that want to sell or, or license their data. So we'll do a market value an analysis. Um, for uh, internal data uses um, or use cases, we'll want to assess the um, the income approach. What is this you know, data assets? How could this data asset contribute to increasing revenue, right? Or reducing expenses, or in the case of government, increasing economic activity. But then you need to balance both of those with the cost basis, you know, and determine the margin that your data is producing, right? Um, it's a and it's a pretty simple you know math equation. What's the the uh, you know economic benefits, the measurable economic benefits over the the costs, and so the idea then is to you know uh, reduce that denom denominator and increase the numerator, numerator. Um, and that's really the kind of the crux of our whole um, you know, the consulting that I'm that I'm doing is to help organizations do both of those. Now back to what Carl was talking about, there are other ways we can measure data data's we could measure data using non financial metrics like. Um, uh, one I call the intrinsic value, uh, which is an aggregate of its um, quality characteristics and scarcity. Data that is high quality and is more scarce, meaning more proprietary to your organization, that typically has greater value. We can also look at um, and uh, data assets um, business value. Uh, that is how um, how how um, relevant is that data to one or more business processes. And then we can also look at the uh, data assets uh, contribution to or include how it can increase or affect a non-financial KPI. So, yeah. So those are the six main models that I've outlined in, in Infonomics, the intrinsic value, the business value, the performance value um, on the non-financial side. And then on the financial side, the um, cost approach, the market approach, and the income approach. And I talked about how to apply those to data and what are some of the nuances because data has these unique, you know, economic qualities. And the perform I mean the performance value is the one that I get mm. stuck in this do loop basically of you know, okay, we we can't really do business without this data. So, mm -hmm. you know, the value of it is that makes me, that for me that makes measuring the value difficult because your ability to do business is contingent on you having this thing. Yeah. And so how do we then measure the value of something that we can't do with? I mean that that <laughs> I I yeah. end up really stuck on that whole problem, and I think that's the crux of a lot of problems in information management because you know yeah. we have got a, a locks and keys problem. You know mm -hmm. we don't have a you know, how how do we value and monetize this thing? We've got a whole bunch of locks and we have an individual key for each one, and I mean, how, how do you think about that problem and how do you work through that? Um, we, we recognize that data is part of an overall equation for generating business value. So any kind of activity, just say a sales activity or the activity of a, of a salesperson, um, they're, um, the, the resources that they use are data and other resources. 
And so we have to come kind of come up with an allocation. How do we allocate data among these other resources that are contributing to this value stream? And sometimes it's pretty arbitrary. Sometimes we say, yeah, maybe it's 5% of the overall resources, right? Um, uh, there's application resources, there's physical resources, there's human capital resources. So, you know, we'll say maybe it's 5%, maybe it's 10%, but we'll come up with uh, an, an agreement on that. But I think more important than valuing the discrete um, you know, value of a, of, a, of a data asset is, again, increasing that numerator and decreasing that denominator. So it's more, uh, I'm more interested in kind of the trajectory. You know, how can we, how can we do that over time? You know, our measurement may be inaccurate and any valuation expert will tell you valuation is a, uh, is as much an art as it is a science. Um, but we try to document our assumptions and be consistent in, in our assumptions, right? And if we are, then we can track over time, how are we improving the value of a data asset by improving its quality? How are we improving its delivered value by finding more use cases for it? How are we increasing its margin by reducing the cost to manage that data? Um, and all those things come into play. So you just need a model upfront by the sounds of things that everybody agrees to so that ultimately, I mean, like every model, you know, ultimately, you know, which levers you push on to, you know, what, what things you're measuring and yeah. so that you can actually measure the impact of your actions using the model. Right. You may have heard it said before, you know, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. One of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So we've probably got time for one more thing. So Doug, um, would you like to just run us through how you actually look at the, like what's the actual process for monetizing data or thinking about that? Yes, yeah, so we take a, a good question. We take a, a stage kind of gated approach. The first phase we'll look at, we'll, we'll do some ideation exercises. We'll understand what data a company has. Um, we'll maybe do a little quality analysis on it. Um, and then we'll run some workshops. We're looking at what is the, what's the extended business ecosystem? You know, who, who are the potential buyers or users or consumers of this data internally and externally? We'll try to maybe even develop personas for them. Um, we will run some hypotheses. You know, how can we take maybe an existing report that's doing hindsight oriented analytics and how can we um, augment it to do more uh, predictive or prescriptive or diagnostic analytics um, and bake that into a data product. We'll um, look at the various ways that we could package a, the data product. We'll look at um, uh, the, the, what other organizations have done and how can we maybe adapt or adopt some of those ideas. So the, this is all part of those workshops. And then we will, at the end of these workshops, end up generating usually around 100 or so ideas. Um, and then we go into a prioritization where we're looking at them uh, from a feasibility standpoint. We're looking at various um, benefit feasibility characteristics and challenge or risk characteristics, um, and then use that to prioritize and weight um, the ideas. Then we'll get into a phase where we're maybe prototyping them, doing a deeper economic analysis, doing a market analysis, and then we move into the design and you know and build phase. Yeah. That's wow. It. God, I'd love That's to be involved thing. in that. <laughs> yeah. We'll just have to go Sounds out and get like some projects fun. and do that. Yeah. 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 So we'd, we'd better wrap this one up. But um, thanks so much, Doug, for your time and for That's all your insights. really, really interesting. Yeah. My pleasure. Really uh, uh, great to be with you all and uh, look forward to promoting the, 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 the podcast. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. We'll talk Cheers. to you all soon. See you. Yep. Bye for now. Take care. Bye. Cheers.